beyond appearances of aesthetics and beauty. Along these lines, thinking like an artist, Einstein discovered the special theory of relativity and the light quantum in 1905, and then went on to discover much else. And conversely, Picasso, the artist, thought like a scientist, having in mind contemporaneous developments in mathematics, science, and technology, as they had been explained to him by his think tank, who called themselves La Banda Picasso. Thinking along these lines, thinking like an artist, allowed Picasso to go beyond the post-impressionism of Paul Cezanne to invent uh, a new aesthetic, cubism, and allowed him to paint his 1907 masterpiece, Les Demoiselles d'Avignon. Now, I have found that at the nascent moment of discovery, using Einstein and Picasso as an example, scientists and artists think along the same conceptual lines. For Einstein and Picasso, it was to discover a new aesthetic. For Einstein, it was the aesthetic of minimalism. For Picasso, the aesthetic of reducing forms to geometry. In other words, a style or aesthetic of cubism. Some other signs of rapprochement between physics and, and art was in 1910 with the exhibit of uh, Kandinsky's completely, the first time a completely abstract painting was exhibited. Uh, he called it improvisation. And he said he was inspired by Einstein's E equals MC squared, where E equals MC squared relates energy, which is diffuse, to mass that is localized. To Kandinsky, this meant that everything was amorphous. And then in 1931, Salvador Dali uh, exhibited his The Persistence of Memory, tired, drooping clocks, clocks tired from being in motion as, and running slowly, as predicted by Einstein's special relativity theory. By 1956, Dali had folded quantum physics into his world picture and changed his the persistence of memory to the disintegration of the persistence of memory. In other words, the world becomes atomized. The world becomes discrete. Now, whereas in the first half of the 20th century, science, uh, artists did not use, uh, in the first half of the 20th century, artists used only the concepts of science. But in the second half of the 20th century, they began to use scientific equipment and actually collaborate with scientists. Billy Kluver was amongst those who encouraged this. Kluver's day job was as an engineer at that font of creativity, Bell Labs in Murray Hill, New Jersey. Nights he spent in the village hanging out with artists. Kluver wrote, in the future, I see the artist having more and more impact as he learns more about technical processes. The art and technology movement does hold the seeds of radical possibilities not just for the artist, but for the engineer as well. This was the beginning of, this was the onset of collaboration. Uh, often Kluver brought down 20 or 30 engineers from Bell Labs that hang, had to hang out in the village with artists and see what they're doing. As when, and, and these people do almost nothing about art. As Leonard Robinson, one of them recollected, when I heard we were going to Robert Rauschenberg's atelier, I thought it was a Jewish delicatessen. That's how much I knew about art. Uh, Kluver organized, uh, Kluver set up an organization which he called Experiments in Art and Technology, EAT. And in, in October 1966, they put on an extravaganza. Uh, it featured stars of the art world, including uh, John Cage sitting on the left and on a table piled high with electronic equipment that Cage had put together with engineers from Bell Labs. In the background, Merce Cunningham, is holding up a female dancer. And the idea of this, of this piece of art is that dancer's movement uh, stimulated light and sound. A. Michael Knoll it was an engineer, uh, a colleague of uh, Kluver's at Bell Labs. Uh, Knoll, uh, by the way, coined the term computer art. As Knoll put it, full exploitation of a, of a machine's unique talents could result in an entirely new medium, a creative artistic medium. Now, Noel spun his magic on the big as a room IBM 7094 machines, which have less power than your telephone. Uh, one of his projects was that he programmed the machine to produce a distribution of dots according to a Gaussian distribution, a bell-shaped curve. Then he programmed the plotter to uh, connect the dots from top to bottom in a random manner to produce a continuous zigzag. And he called this Gaussian 
distribution. By the end of the 20th century, powerful machines came, in, came online. Among them was IBM's Deep Blue, programmed to play chess. And in 1997, it defeated Garry Kasparov, the then chess world champion. Uh, afterwards, Kasparov said that he glimpsed a weird sort of intelligence. Notable was that in the, third, in the 44th move of the second game, the machine made a sacrifice that absolutely, you know, drove, drove Kasparov nuts. He became incandescent. He complained to the engineers at Bell Labs that they had slipped a human being in the loop. Apparently what had happened is that the machine skipped, skipped its playbook for the middle game and went beyond, went beyond its algorithm. Uh, it thought outside of the box, in other words. And here, one is reminded of the story of Mozart and his father. Mozart taught his son the rules for composing music, the algorithms for, for composing music, but we don't attribute the son's music to the father. After, after uh, Deep Blue came IBM Watson, which, uh, which won it, which became a championship, it became a champion at, at, the, at the quiz game of Jeopardy. Now, both of these machines have the same innards as your laptop. Uh, the same inners or architecture as your laptop. In other words, they are laptop on steroids. They're called symbol machines because they use rules for solving problems, for dealing with data. They're like logic machines. But waiting quietly in the wings was another sort of machine, the artificial neural network, which is made up of three parts. Uh, an input layer where the data to be analyzed sits, and then the middle part of the machine which is made up of layers of artificial neurons, this, uh, which are wired up to loosely emulate how the neurons in your brain are wired up. This is the brain of the machine. This is where the machine does its analysis. This is where it thinks. The result of the analysis is then passed to the output layer. Uh, these machines required more power and data than was available in the 1980s and 1990s. I did not burst upon the scene until 2012, when that power and data was available and they won a contest for recognizing images and animals, for example. They have the ability, artificial neural networks have the ability to learn from data without being programmed to do so. This is called machine learning. In 2016, an artificial neural network running the algorithm AlphaGo uh, defeated a, a highly regarded Go master named Lee Sedol. At that point, everyone agreed that the venerable 2,500 year old game of Go had been cracked by a machine. That was a wow moment in AI. The Chinese consider it to have been their Sputnik moment. Eerily, uh, another, instant of, another instance of the move that foiled Kasparov was no, move number 37 of the second game. It was a move that you were not supposed to make at that point in a game of Go. And in fact, uh, Lee Sedo and the AlphaGo team thought the machine had hit a glitch but they quickly realized it was a killer move. Uh, the machine went beyond its algorithm. We may say that the machine showed glimmers of creativity. Next, I want to discuss some extraordinary machines that can make art, compose music, and write screenplays. And I'd like you to keep in mind the question, can these machines be, be creative like us? Let's begin with machines that make art. Uh, in 2015, Alexander Mordvinsev, an engineer at Google's offices in Zurich, uh, decided to set out to tackle the problem of what goes on in the artificial neural networks layers that sit inside the machine, the so-called hidden layers. Jarringly, we still don't understand how they work, but we don't understand how our brain works either. But this is, this is a serious problem unto itself because artificial neural networks play a central role in our, in our lives, they, they're, they're behind our, power our phones. They are the, they're the centerpiece of the internet of things. And they are important for, uh, for automated vehicles, autonomous vehicles. For this purpose, uh, Mortvensev invented Deep Dream. This is Mortvensev and yours truly at the 2019 uh, uh, Lumen Art Exhibition, Lumen Art Competition Exhibition in London where I served as a judge. As Mordvensev said to me, the code has always been the artwork. Code is my paintbrush. I seem to be missing my lapel phone. <laughs> I see, I, I, if I move away from the microphone, I think that 
I'm not, I'm not heard. Oh, okay. bit of a technical equipment. <laughs> uh, yeah, okay. What well, Vents have invented Deep Dream, the algorithm Deep Dream. And it is, it is for the purpose of figuring out what goes on in the hidden layers that he invented this algorithm. What Vents have trained his machine running the algorithm Deep Dream on, the, on a huge database called ImageNet, which contains over 14 million images of everything under the sun. So say you take this JPEG of an, of an adorable cat against the verdant background, and let's now take that JPEG and run it entirely through the machine, through every single layer in the machine. And on and, and the output layer, the machine will give you a message like, um, I'm 99.999% sure that, this, that the animal in this, in, in this JPEG is a cat. Artificial neural networks are probabilistic machines. But, but so are we, you know, we say, well, I think yesterday I saw so-and-so, so that's not so bad. Now, say you take that JPEG and now feed it to an artificial neural network, once again, running Deep Dream, trained on ImageNet and, and put the brakes on, stop the analysis partway through as some layer of neurons. What does the machine see? Now, most computer scientists thought that the machine would see a blurry version of the cat. Not so, it sees this, I mean, that's, called the monster beast. And that's a real wow. This is surreal, totally unexpected. It's the world as seen through the eyes of an alien being, a machine. What's happening here is that deep dream overinterprets parts of the image, allowing us, allowing it to see what we cannot. Mike Tyker is an engineer at Google's offices in Seattle, and he immediately saw the artistic potential in deep dream. Uh, as Tyker said to me, I believe the brain is a computer. So obviously machines can be creative. Being a techno-optimist, I wholeheartedly agreed. Now what Taika did was rather ingenious. Instead of inserting an image, he inserted a JPEG of noise, random dots. He fed a, an artificial neural network running deep dreams and trained on ImageNet with a JPEG of random dots, thereby stimulating just about every of, of the 14 million images inside, inside of the machine. Uh, he stopped analysis partway through. Then the machine, run, the machine is running through its, the poor machine is running through its repertoire of images and, and to, to look for what really isn't there. And then he took the JPEG out, put it back in, stopped analysis at the same layer of, of neurons, and then took the images that emerge, zoomed in on them, zoomed out on them to produce this extraordinary video. There are image, images inside of images inside of images. It's this fractal quality that gives, uh, that lends a lot of the beauty to this, uh, to this video. It's, it's, it's hallucinatory, sort of in the same sense that, that people under the influence of LSD report hallucinations. Now, what if we took a JPEG of Van Gogh's starry sky, fed it to an artificial neural network, running deep dream, trained on ImageNet, stop analysis partway through, what would we see? Well, something like this. I mean, we don't see something like that. The machine, the machine sees that. Now, about a year ago, Mort Fensev came to the realization that all along he had been doing art as well as computer science, but he just hadn't realized it. As he put it, the code has always been the artwork. Code is my paintbrush. And here he is hanging one of his creations for an art show in Zurich, uh, he's being helped by his wife, Lana, who uh, discusses with him the artistic side of, uh, of, of Deep Dream. Uh, Lana, in, incidentally, uh, encouraged him, and indeed, Mort Ventsev insisted, that uh, the title of artist is put next to his name as research scientist. 
Now, although Deep Dream did not solve the problem of what goes on in the machine's hidden layers, uh, it shed some light on how neurons on how neurons contribute to the emergent image. Uh, Mortvensev's monster cat picture has certainly earned a place in any future history of the Visual Arts Museum because it was a groundbreaking image, opening doors to a burgeoning field of art, and it also influenced many young people to go into AI. And it also spawned an art movement with its own style, that is to say, its own aesthetic. When you see images of this sort, you immediately know that they were created by, by Deep Dream. And so we may say that a machine running Deep Dream can see what we cannot. Now, while artificial neural networks were very good at recognizing faces and animals, they were not so good at creating images from scratch. Then along came generative adversarial networks in 2014. Generative adversarial networks was created by uh, Ian Goodfellow, who right now is at Google. And he said to me, from the point of view that creativity means producing something which is new and beneficial, the machine learning algorithms are already at that point. I wholeheartedly agreed with him. Now, a generative adversarial network is made up of two networks. One is a generator network that generates images from scratch, from noise, and then passes these images to a, to a discriminator network, which assesses them whether they are real or not, relative to what's in its database, relative to what it's been trained on. So say the discriminator network was trained on thousands of faces scraped from the web. Uh, let's start the process going. The generator network generates images, they're just from noise, they're just blobs, sends them up to the discriminator network that immediately sends them back. This iteration goes on thousands of times until finally the generator network gets the idea to generate faces. Pleasant looking faces like that, the thing is, is that these faces belong to nobody on the planet Earth. Generative adversarial networks give, give machines the ability to dream, to imagine, to begin to build an inner life of their own. Uh, this sort of demonstration, this piece of artwork was conceived by Mike Tyka, who we met previously, who called it, who called it imaginary, imaginary people. Now there's a human hand behind Deep Dream and GAN, a hand that chooses the target image and how the machine is trained, the training process itself, the choice of data is itself a creative, a creative act. This is the hand of the AI artist. The AI artist is a new breed of artist. The AI artist is artist and technologist rolled into one. The AI artist creates with code. You've already met two of them, Maud Vincev and Taika. A third one is, is uh, Mario Klingemann, who is a pioneering AI artist. As Klingemann said to me, human creativity is limited, to which I wholeheartedly agreed, the implication being that machine creativity is unlimited. Uh, let's look at a couple of uh, works of Klingemann from his vast repertoire. Uh, he, he calls the series from where these two works come from his transcendence series, a transhancement series, I should say, and he calls them transhancement one and transhancement two. Well, they surely can be described as surprising. In fact, they're rather unsettling. They're complex, ambiguous, and novel, all indicators of creativity. And here's another one, a recent one called The Butcher's Son. I put this up here to uh, emphasize that the style or aesthetic of, uh, of generative adversarial networks is of a Francis Bacon-esque sort. Klingemann refers to his artwork as, well, somewhere between the, paint, the digital and the painterly. Anna Riddler is a London-based artist who uses GAN to make films. As she said to me, AI has a way of suggesting things, and we'll see what that means in a moment. Uh, Riddle was always bothered by not being entirely in control of the huge data sets, usually used for training machines, because these, the, be, be, uh, beyond being, uh, in addition to being difficult to handle, they uh, racial and sexual biases creep in. She wanted to build her own data set. She created her own data set from the, fil from, uh, from the silent film, Fall of the House of Usher, based on a short story by Edgar Allan Poe. She created her own data set from the film's frames. What she did was she took a portion of the film, 200 frames, cut them up electronically, redrew them, and then processed them five or six times 
through generative adversarial networks. It is in, is in, it is in this way that uh, AI or GAN can suggest new data. The end result is a ghostly succession of abstract images, increasingly so as time passed, a highly original take on Poe's original on Poe's study of decay and death. Let's look at part of her of her video. Interestingly done. To conclude this section of my talk on AI art, I'd like to make two points. One, machines can see and imagine what we cannot. You can see what we cannot through deep dream and imagine what we cannot through generative adversarial networks. Secondly, one thing is for sure, we should not compare AI created art to the previous art because AI created art is a world as seen through the eyes of a machine. We ought, of course, ask whether machines, whether machines can be creative, but we should also bear in mind the question, can we learn to appreciate art we know has been created by a machine from end to end? And that goes for AI-created literature and music as well, to which I now turn. Well, let's look at AI-created literature. Uh, AI researchers consider AI humor to be the final frontier because it contains all the intelligences. Imagine, this is by the joke I started off my talk with, imagine what goes into getting this joke and creating it as well. It requires an understanding of the meaning of words, word play, such as with ironies and metaphors, in addition to awareness and emotions. Presently, machines have none of the above, but I'm quite sure that in time, they will possess these facets of, shall we say, humanity, whatever humanity will mean at this time in, 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 the, in the distant future. I will return to humor and a little bit later. What about screenplays? Ross Goodwin is a computer scientist uh, who said to me, uh, we are on the verge of creative machines. It seems inevitable to me. I agreed with him, of course. Now in collaboration with Oscar Sharp, a filmmaker, Goodwin trained an artificial neural network on hundreds of TV sci-fi film scripts, like from programs like Star Trek, uh, Stargate, X-Files. Then he used an algorithm called char RNN that predicts sequences of words based on the input corpus it was trained on. Then one uses a seed sentence to kick off the whole process and to paraphrase Goodwin's seed sentence, I don't care what you think, I'm gonna do this anyway. Then the machine spat out a screenplay replete with stage directions. They called the screenplay Sunspring. It was the first AI scripted film. Sunspring is a sci-fi drama in which the actors deliver their gnomic lines with, uh, with, with passion and intensity, making them make sense. Uh, Goodwin is fond of reminding everyone that there are people who have trouble understanding Shakespeare on the printed page, but enjoy seeing his plays. Here is a cut from Sunspring. A big, honest idea. I am not a bright light. Well, I have to uh, go to the skull. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> What do you mean? Well, I, I don't know anything about any of this, so. The actor spits out his eyeball. Uh, then what? There's no answer. We're going to see the money. <laughs> All right, you can't tell me that. Yeah, I was coming to that thing, you know, because you're so 
Pretty. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what you're talking about. That's right. So, uh, what are you doing? I don't want to be honest with you. You don't have to be a doctor. I'm not sure. I don't know what you're talking about. I want to see you too. What do you mean? I'm sure you wouldn't even touch me. I don't know what you're talking about. The principal is completely constructed of the same time. <laughs> it's all about you to be true. You didn't even watch the movie with the rest of the base. I don't know. I don't care. I know. It's a consequence. Whatever you need to know about the presence of the story, I'm a little bit of a boy on the floor. I don't know. I, I need you to explain to me what you say. What do you mean? Well, you saw this actor spit out his eyeball. As per the stage direction, actor spits out eyeball. And that's really no more weird than the stage direction from Shakespeare's The Winter's Tale, Exit followed by a, pursued by a bear. I've become especially intrigued with work exploring the, the boundary between sense and what appears to be nonsense as in, as in Goodwin's. Machines are particularly adept at this line of research because they can create texts that don't work in the way that people are used to language working. In this way, AI can change the landscape of language. And this is not unlike what was going on in the 1840s when the camera was invented which freed artists from a too literal interpretation of nature and opened the doors to the impressionists. So machines can be expected to affect the course of literature, just as they have affected the course of art and music. Now, Sunspring is certainly interesting and amusing, but the algorithm that created it has, of course, been superseded by GPT-3, Generative Pre-trained Transformer. The three means it's the third in a sequence of devices. GPT-3 is an immensely powerful language model. It can generate human-like prose. I'm going to play a video uh, which was scripted by GPT-3. Note particularly the introduction. The short you're about to see has been written by artificial intelligence. I wrote the first few lines of the script and fed it into the program. When you see a dot appear on your screen, it means that the script is now being written as loud as it goes. The AI. We present to you, solicitor. I'm a Jehovah's Witness. Oh, well, I'm sorry. I don't talk to solicitors. But uh, I have a great story. Note that. I was a drug dealer. Shootouts, shootouts, shootouts. In retrospect, it was a very dangerous job, but I loved it. <laughs> and then I hit this cop car. And they... I was weaving through the city, but they were so fast. And then I saw a road that led to this alley. And I figured, since I had some time, I could lose them. So I swerved. There were two women in the alley. They were arguing. I was going too fast. They didn't see me. hit them and the car turned over and over and over that's the worst pain i've ever had but they lived i didn't before i died god appeared to me and told me that if i would come here and tell you this he would bring me back to life. I was instructed to tell you the whole story. <clears throat> uh, 
What's your name? Rudy. Do you believe in God? I did once. Do you, do you want to come in? I don't want to die. <laughs> well, come in anyway. It's about time for us to do dinner. That's the worst story I've ever heard. I'm really gonna die. What? What are you doing? Don't you remember where you met me? And I'm a drug dealer. And shootouts? Shootouts are fun. He dies. <laughs> uh, well, not all that good and not all that bad either. Not particularly the unexpected ending, which faked everyone out. Could that be another glimmer of creativity? Uh, the script was kind of weird because GPT-3 has trouble with word meanings. It's not fluent in the, English, in the English language with all its nuances and tropes. Now, although GPT-3 can generate impressive text, it's right 50% of the time, which means it's wrong as much as it's right. Uh, that's not so bad for literature or certainly not for poetry, but for nonfiction it is. Indeed, caveat am tour, when you're reading a magazine article, a, a book or a newspaper, and the author all of a sudden says, you wouldn't believe it, but the paragraph you just read was written by a machine. Well, sure, but that's about the fifth or sixth try. It was cherry picked and the factual content was cleaned up by a human editor. Uh, so one, one has to be somewhat careful how one accepts these things. Uh, but GPT-3 has some interesting uses. Uh, it's, it's useful as a collaborator in that if a writer has writer's block, all of a sudden can't proceed past a certain paragraph, the writer can put that paragraph as a seed sentence into GPT-3, which then will produce something uh, which might inspire the writer. And then there is another, then there is another uh, interesting uh, use, I should, I, I should say experiment going on for GPT-3 to write captions for cartoons. Uh, the New Yorker at the end of each, each week's issue has a cartoon with no caption. And the people, it's very popular. Thousands of people send in uh, uh, suggestions. And then the staff of the New Yorker uh, picks the top three. And in fact, we have someone here, uh, Bob Mankoff, who was pre previously been cartoon editor of, of for the New Yorker sitting in the back. I'm sure we'll hear from him later. And so, okay, this is a, this is a cartoon. The, the, the seed sentence given to GPT-3 was somewhere along the lines of, Five guys with metal detectors are walking around this couch on which is sitting a man and a woman, and the woman turns to the man and says, well, this is one of GPT-3 suggestions, which wasn't too bad. Don't worry, dear, it's just the magnetism of my personality. Well, we got some chuckles, it wasn't, it wasn't too bad. Uh, so th this is one interesting use of, of GPT-3 to, for it to develop along these lines. Uh, GPT-4, having said all that, uh, criticizing GPT-3. Uh, but by the way, GPT-3 is good for about 300 words. Then it goes south. It has to be, uh, you know, ramped up or started over again. Uh, that being said, uh, somewhere along the line, and GPT-4 is, is about to come online, somewhere in the future, uh, the machine that all these GPTs work on will have to have emotions, and consciousness to yield truly human-like text. But then again, we want machines to surprise us, to go on to generate prose of their own, just like we want uh, AI art to create art of its own and so on. Art, uh, prose and art that we presently cannot imagine. Who knows, in the far distant future, perhaps machines will have to explain their literature to us. Now, let's uh, look at AI created music. And here, uh, 
collaboration is a big thing, as it is throughout AI. And I want to uh, show you a case in which human and machine bootstrap each other's creativity, which is the big dream of collaboration, the big goal of collaboration between humans and machines. Not for machines to take humans' jobs, but for the two of them to work together. And what I want to look at is Francois Pache's continuing. Pache is a computer scientist slash musician who presently directs Spotify's Creator Technology Research Lab in Paris. And as Pache said to me, how do you compose a compelling song? A song that remains in your head and the heads of millions of people. And by song, he includes melodies of improv, improvisation. Pache is keen on jazz. Some years ago, he came up with a problem of how can I improve a musician's uh, creativity and improvisation? And he came up with the AI device continuator. I'm going to play you a video. which a musician is sitting in a piano, not, a, not an ordinary piano, this is a super duper piano. It's a Yamaha disc clavier, which is, which is built to be at one with a machine, with a computer. Now the, the musician begins to improvise. Uh, his notes are parsed into uh, phrases and then these are phrase, sent to a phrase analyzer, which looks for patterns. And it is along these lines that the AI device continuator creates an improvisation in response to the musician's improvisation. Now, usually improvisation is defined as a conversation between a musician and a musical instrument. Here's a conversation between a musician and an AI. Notice continuing, it cuts in seamlessly. And notice also the look of surprise on the musician's face. As the cycle goes on, continuator creates more complex improvisations. And now the musician responds to his own improvisation to the AI's improvisation. Okay, oops. So what is a talk on AI without robots? Uh, in 2015, the musician, computer scientist, Mason, Mason Breton, the human being in this picture, uh, along with two robots, she, a set of robots called Shimi on his right, and the robot Shimon on his left collaborated to produce an extraordinary jam session they called uh, What You Say, styled after a jam session by Miles Davis. The smallest, she, the smallest Shimi robots move rhythmically to input music, while Shimon generates an improvisation responding to human performers. Shimon listens and responds. Shimon has embodiment, which means that it seeks to find a way to complete a task. In this, in this instance, to play a marimba. Uh, Shimon is a four-handed marimba player. Uh, let's look at a session. Let's look at this jam session. And first, let's let uh, Shimi have a moment in the sun. Cuddly little things. At one time, you can buy them for $15,000 a piece. And now let's look at everybody performing.
So Shimon moves almost as a, the aura of a human being, especially with that faceplate. like a seasoned jazz musician. Breton is an all-around musician. This group goes out on the road. People pay to see them. You can listen to this for quite a while. As Breton said to me, through the power of artificial intelligence, signal processing, and engineering, I firmly believe it is possible for machines to be artistic, creative, and inspirational. Imagine that a machine being inspirational. Uh, and indeed, this is along the lines of why I wrote my AI book to, to emphasize the, up part, the, the, the upside of AI. I mean, usually books on AI are written as the danger to society and, and the presaging dystopian situations, but there's an upside to AI, the cultural side. Now, uh, let's pause before taking the plunge into whether machines can have human characteristics of creativity and so be creative like us. And by human characteristics of creativity, I mean the following, competitiveness, emotions, awareness, and consciousness, among others. And what I'm about to say is from my own theory of creativity, which covers both humans and machines. Now we have seen that even in their current somewhat narrow limited state, but machines AI have shown glimmers of creativity. Creating music, uh, videos. Which is a, which is a substantial step forward. When we Maria, make a substantial Maria, step forward Munson, and produce something that goes way beyond a, the material we have to work with, we call that creativity. Um, Why not recognize the machine's creativity in the same mm -hmm. way? Why the pushback? Well, I think that many people balk at the very notion of machine creativity because they're afraid of it actually coming to pass. But why should creativity be an attribute reserved only for us? For example, all definitions of art that I've come across state that the final product must have been instigated by a human being. But why must there always be a person in the loop? Making that restriction means that while machines can create art, they could never truly be artists from end to end. Game over. In the age of AI, this argument is totally wrongheaded, ignoring as it does dramatic developments in AI, which, which mean which lead to the which lead to the circumstance which will lead to the circumstance that creativity will be extended to machines that but that have emotions, consciousness, and volition. In other words, uh, the urge to create. Today, affective computing is a hot research field, focusing right now on machines recognizing human emotions. Okay, let's now look at some instances of how machines can have human characteristics of creativity and so be creative like us. I'm going to start with competitiveness. And I can sense that some of your eyes are rolling. Uh, I mean, what is this guy talking about? How, how can machines be competitive? Well, let's remind ourselves that highly creative work often operates in a distinctly Darwinian environment. One must fight for the acceptance of one's ideas. And great thinkers have been known to steal ideas from their competitors. Can machines share these characteristics? Well, a robotics research group at L'Ecole Polytechnique Federale in Lausanne did a, did a number of experiments with very simple robots. The robots in that, in the, in that picture, uh, they look like they, uh, a, a detailed version is shown on the left, they look like hockey pucks. Uh, they're, they run partly on artificial neural networks with just one layer of neurons, and they are programmed to forage for food. And it was found amazingly that down the line, after many, many iterations, some, form, some robots form small groups and shield their visual signals from other robots, hoarding food for themselves. And so this, this research team summarized their results. Sophisticated forms of communication and deceptive signaling can evolve in groups of robots with simple neural networks. 
So in other words, we can involve robots that can be deceptive, can even lie, forms of emotion. Even among robots, there is survival of the fittest. Now, people might argue that machines cannot be truly creative because they are not out there in the world, having emotional experiences like communing with nature and falling in love. But they can acquire such knowledge vicariously. In the not too distant future, machines will be able to read a language fluently, which means they will be able to truly read the web and acquire more knowledge than we can in a lifetime. And in this way, experience being out there, however vicariously, and be able to convince themselves and us that they have had experiences that seem to be essential to creativity, such as inspiration, love, hate, anger, and so on. Then we will wire them up with complex systems of sensors, regulative mechanisms, and communication pathways by means of which they will evolve a set of emotions that are duplicates of ours. Now, the gorgeous lady sitting next to me is a sex bot <laughs> that I met at Ars Electronica, which is a conference and uh, a research venue in Linz, Austria. Presently, they have clumsy responses and comic book-like features, but in the future, sex bots will undoubtedly transform human relations. But by then, the, no the notion of what it is to be a human will have been dramatically, dramatically transformed. Indeed, perhaps artificial intimacy will be the real intimacy. Now, a stumbling block in machine creativity is awareness. Machines are not aware. That is to say, they don't have a clue that they've just made a beautiful move and go or chess. They don't have a clue that they've just painted a beautiful picture. And robot comedians are entirely unaware that they've just cracked a hilarious joke. Machines cannot be considered to be truly creative until they have emotions, awareness, and volition, uh, which will, again, give them the urge to create. And consciousness as well. Well, what is consciousness and will, and will machines ever have it? Two key elements essential to consciousness are awareness and self-awareness. Machines have a primitive sense of self-awareness in that they're aware of their circuitry and of the problem they're working on. Uh, consciousness is our essence, our inner being, our inner life, and so is essential to our creativity. But many philosophers still argue that consciousness is such a private realm of being that it cannot be analyzed using science. But today, in the age of AI, the problem of consciousness has moved from the philosophical to the scientific. Now, after wrestling with the problem of consciousness for some years, I have come to the conclusion that it emerges from the data processing of incoming information by the 100 billion neurons that make up our brain. And so consciousness is computable, it's reducible to numbers. And so there is no reason why computers cannot be programmed to have consciousness, just as in a sense, we're programmed to have consciousness because we are after all, merely machines. Details are in my book. Now, what about problem discovery and uh, problem discovery and finding connections between disciplines that at first seem to have no connection whatsoever. This is a very high level of creativity. Uh, it's, you either, you, you can't be taught those facets of thought. Either you have them or you don't. So this level is occupied by people of the ilk of an Einstein. Uh, but I don't want to be construed as if I'm restricting my, uh, my comments only to scientists. I, have, of course, have in mind artists, musicians, and writers, all of whom can make, you know, domain-busting work in their own field and change the, change the direction of their field. Now, as an example of uh, problem discovery, I mean, let's, since we're in a physics department, let's take, uh, let's take science. In any field of science, in any discipline of a field of science, most of the workers in that field are working on the same problem. This is a problem that everyone has decided is a key problem and must be solved in order for the field to be moved forward. But however, somebody can come along and say, uh, well, look, you're working on the wrong problem. You've all been wasting your time. This is what Einstein did in 1905. Now, problem, problem discovery can also occur in the arts, although to a lesser extent, some examples are in art. Picasso, if you wanted to be part of the avant-garde, you worked in cubism or one of his offshoots. In music, there was Bach, Beethoven, Stockhausen, Reich, and Glass. 
in literature. Samuel Richardson invents a novel in the 18th century. That was a wow moment. And then you went had the the uh, the the satirist uh, amongst them, Alexander Pope, and then the symbolist, the symbolist Stéphane Stéphane Mellamé, an author Rambo, who moved against the going style of realism. Can machines work at that level and and achieve momentous breakthroughs? Well, astonishingly, machines have the potential to do so because remember, text and equations can be encoded in numbers, which are grist for the mill of artificial neural networks shown here in all their glory next to Einstein. Now let's take that artificial neural network and move it way into the future. It, it may look different, but the machine that it works on will be jam packed with every bit of knowledge that has accrued on the planet Earth. And since we're in the physics department, let's say that machine is put on the field of physics and it notices a little part of that field of physics that is bedeviled, that has, uh, it's, it's, it's bedeviled with uh, redundancies and inconsistencies, which is sometimes a sign that the wrong problem is being considered. So the machine will look at, will, will, will analyze uh, concepts that are indigenous to that field of physics, concepts that impinge on that bedeviled field of physics from other fields of physics, and concepts that barely touch on that field of physics, concepts from disciplines that seem to, at first sight to have nothing to do with science like, like art, history, literature, and philosophy. And lo and behold, the machine may well find that one of those strange concepts gives it the clue of, of where to look for the proper research problem. Okay, back to the present, where we have groups of scientists, medical scientists, working with machines to try to uh, discover more about COVID and how to deal with it. Uh, these machines may have algorithms such as Semantic Scala, created at the Allen Institute, which has the capability of looking for connections among over 200 million scientific papers, in this case, medical scientific papers. And this collaboration of human scientists with machines can come up with, and indeed has come up with, hypotheses that are far wider and deeper than hypotheses that only, scientists, only human scientists can. So as with Deep Dream, AlphaGo, and GAN, machines can see and imagine what we cannot. Now, as for the question I posed at the beginning of my talk, can AI be the next Picasso? Well, the next Picasso in the sense of busting domains and creating art that goes far beyond what anyone expected. So the answer is yes. And that goes for literature and music too. We are looking for something fresh and unexpected from AI. After all, are we not dealing with, with, an, with an alien life form? So today I've mentioned human creativity, then moved to uh, mach machine creativity and to collaborations between humans and machines. All this points to a future in which machines will work by themselves. In the perhaps not too distant future, machines will evolve that have a set of emotions, a consciousness, and creativity that are duplicates of ours. That will be the age of artificial general intelligence. At that time, and these machines will be as smart as us. At that point in time, the line between artificial or machine intelligence and human or natural intelligence will blur, will disappear, and there will be only intelligence. And maybe not too long beyond that, machines will emerge that are much, much, much smarter than us. That's the age of artificial superintelligence. And these machines, who knows, may have a consciousness and a set, of con a set of emotions and a consciousness that differ fundamentally from ours in ways that we can't even, cannot even imagine. But why not? After all, machine physiology is much different from ours. Right now, it's silicon. Who knows what it will be in the future? But one thing is for sure about machines in the age of artificial superintelligence is that they will be far, far more creative than us because machines have the potential for unlimited creativity. So, so where, where do we stand in all this? What's our role going to be in this brave new world? Are we going to be household pets as, some, uh, as most of dystopian scenarios predict? Unfortunately, they're very popular. Well, that's a very complicated question, what our role will be, because by that time, what it means to be human will, be, will have been dramatically, dramatically, dramatically transformed or are we not merging with machines? 
Now, earlier in my lecture, I broached the question, can we learn to appreciate art, literature, and music that we know has been created by an AI? Our merging with the other, the machine, will make this a moot question. And merging with machines might not be a bad idea because that may be the road for survival of the human race. Again, whatever human will mean by that time, because machines have the potential for looking into the future, sensing problems, and immediately dealing with them, something that we don't seem to be very good at. Thank you. Okay, we'll start with the question that came up. Imagine a code writer can write a code that creatively produced art. Is the code then equal to the work of art? Equivalency is the code writer equal to the artist? I guess he's asking a question about the code. Yeah. What role do they the, co the, the code writer is the artist. Uh, AI artists create, create with code. And code is a work of art. There was, there was an exhibition uh, some years ago at, at the Whitney Museum. Uh, it was called uh, Codex in which uh, world-class coders, six world-class coders were given the, uh, the, the task of writing code for uh, a process in which a, a ball ping-pongs back and forth. And what was, and what was on display was the, the visual result of the code, which was different in, in each of the six cases, as well as the code itself as a work of art. So yes, the, the code can be a work of art. Is the second question. How do we know Mason Breton is a biological human being and not a robot? <laughs> <laughs> he bleeds. <laughs> uh, we know it because we can, we know, we know one of our own, so to speak, okay? And he acts the way we would expect our own to act. And that, that's not going to be uh, true all the way along the line once, ro once robots get off the ground that resemble us, like, like the robots in, uh, uh, in that Ridley Scott picture, what was that? When, with Harrison Ford? Blade Runner. Blade Runner, yeah, Blade Runner, yeah, right. Let me take a question maybe from the audience now at this point. Does anyone from the audience have a question? Yes, and speak loudly. Very loud. Funny, <laughs> who decides what is good, human being or the robot? Or robot? What is good art? What is good music? Is human being decide that or some robot decide that? So well, right now, good. yeah, that, 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 that's a good question. Machines can, can assess their art in generative ad adversarial networks. Uh, but uh, right now, machines cannot do that. Well, I, I, I don't want to say consistently because uh, machine art differs from human art fundamentally. So right now, what, what, what happens is that machines turn out, you know, like have the capacity for turning out 10,000 pieces of art in, in one minute. And what, the, what, what is going on right now is that the human being who is uh, running the machine will decide what is good art, when the machine should stop producing art. But that will change along the line. But what the machine decides as good art will differ from, from what we consider as good art. Just as what the machine uh, writes and what the machine composes as music will be different from us. Right now, Shimon, I don't have a, uh, I don't have a video with me right now, but that robot Shimon who moves like a, a human being uh, can now uh, write songs can write the music and the words for songs. And now he has a movable mouth. And he also has eyebrows that just come up and down, the, the metal eyebrows. Uh, the words, he, he composes the music and then a, uh, a prompt is given, like somebody says rain, and he'll produce a song about rain. Uh, these robots, the, the, the new robot, new Shimon robot works on artificial neural networks. So it has in its, in its minds, in its brain, so to speak, over 50,000 song, pop songs, as well as jazz pieces as well. And so, and it 
as discovered for itself, chord transitions, for example, things of that sort. So the music it produces is, is very interesting, uh, a little bit different from ours, uh, and the words are, are really weird. <laughs> Has the machine ever done hip hop or something like that? that uh... I'm sure. I'm, I'm sure it can. You 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 feed it hip hop, and it'll produce hip. It'll produce hip hop. And, and what are the users of hip hop or students of? Uh, that I don't know. That I don't know. Yeah, that I don't know. Another question would be, do you think your examples say more that human beings are programmable and machine-like rather than machines are artsy and creative? Sure, but we, we, are, we are programmable. I mean, on a, on, we're all machines, as I mentioned. And on a biological level, that's the highest level, we're programmable to the extent that uh, given drugs, you can, you know, you can act, act in certain ways. Uh, your brain can be altered also by putting chips in the brain. Uh, so yes, humans are certainly programmable. I mean, humans are machines at, at a high level, we're biological machines. At a lower level, we're chemical machines. Then you can certainly imagine uh, uh, changing our behavior. And at, at, at the lowest level, we are made up of protons, neutrons, electrons, gluons, W mesons, and so on. All of which, uh, the, the, the behavior of all of which can be described with the equations of quantum physics which when put on a computer become numbers. So it's numbers all the way down. And I think GPT-3 and GPT-4, et cetera, really are, really exemplify that. It's all numbers, uh, paintings, uh, images of pixels, and they're, they're encoded. Music is encoded as musical notes. Uh, words are encoded. And what you have is these numbers running around in your machine. And you can well imagine sometime in the future, uh, doing a sculpture uh, for, on, on the basis of a Beethoven symphony, for example, or writing, writing, writing a symphony for uh, Lately Dave Moiselle d'Avignon. Yes. So real brains are functioning and their structures determined also by their inputs, by their training, if you will. So all the examples you gave, to what extent are the outputs determined by the statistics of the training that they get? It's all determined by statistics. I mean, it's, it's a probabilistic world we live in. Um, anything, can, anything that you could think of can happen, can happen. It's only the odds of some things happening are, are very small. You know, like you put a, an ink blot, a, a drop of ink in a glass of water, it, it will spread out. Uh, the odds of it coming back together again are are quite small. In fact, they're 2.7 to the 10th to the 24th, which is really, really small. So don't, don't bet on it, but it, it can happen. Yes. Uh, hi, I'm uh -huh. Boston, yeah. and, uh, exactly. running controversy and having great disadvantages, but <laughs> But humor is one of the hard problems, but I think one of the harder problems is sensation. I don't know any amount of information. I've got a worm, C. elegans, 340 euro. That's it. 340 euro. But it's something like to eat that worm. And it's good. Because it's made out of a different substance. And my conversation with Arthur. Computers are just made out of the wrong thing. Made out of the wrong thing. Here. Just and you know, cut the over and over and out of the wrong Not then, then, 
five seconds. All the planets are going around and everything is happening. I think it's numbers. <laughs> well, Reaction. it's early days for machines right now. And uh, machines, sure, they're made out of metal, but that, that, may well, that may well change. There may be weight in size for them as well. And, and, and as for numbers, uh, uh, the, the psychologist Carl Jung said something interesting is that, in that uh, humans made mathematics, but uh, uh, nature made numbers. Okay, so it, it's well. I, everything. Are your opinions to think numbers exist out, outside? Yes, I am. <laughs> if I throw my wallet up and it comes down, it's not numbers that are causing it. It's numbers that are describing it. The numbers don't. It, it, numbers don't cause it. We something causes it. You know, we have but it's not numbers. It's well, numbers. again, your wallet comes up. You 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 have thrown it up. You, you, you've used muscle power to, to throw it up. Well, because I, I, I can, no, just off the top of my head, I can, well, no, I can, I can describe and explain that action of throwing it up in the air by looking at muscles and by looking at a, a microscopic description of what goes on, where uh, you, have, you have numbers to, dis to describe that, that, that condition. Just buy me dinner and I'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 it's no, I, I do believe that it is. It's, oh, certainly. I, I, I certainly agree. Well, that's 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 what it's going to be, and it, it, it may be helpful, <laughs> but it, it need not be a horrible world. Okay, we don't know whether it's going to be a horrible world. Oh, these machines machines will self produce. Machines will self produce in the the plug situation. But if you but but if you are if you are beneficent with them, if you discuss with them creativity, discuss with them. The good way of life. Okay, then there'll be lots of good machines. That we there are bad, there are good humans and bad humans too. But I mean, to describe every every part of our body, there are there is complete reductionism. There was a time I didn't believe in complete reductionism, but but now I do, and that everything can be reduced to atoms and molecules. And uh, once you know how to deal with large numbers of atoms and molecules and elementary particles, this will all become. The whole situation with numbers all the way down will, will clear up. Okay, one last question. And so it's 90 years now, uh, I think, since all this published, published uh, Brave New World. His view of the future is rather Islamic. Okay. Your description of what you see or you think of the you just said there will be good machines and bad machines. Possibly you one one person basically is able to control everything. Yeah. What do you think about that when it comes to AI? Will there be one super super intelligence machine that they can control? One doesn't know. The only the, I mean, you know, that, that the, the whole expression brave in the world has as much uh, much you know maligned when you put it that way. Right now it's used in, in, in an upbeat sense. The brave in the world of the world of machines that will 
make us better, make us healthier, and enable us to live longer, so to speak, enable us not to drive cars, not, not to kill each other with cars. Uh, so, well, I can say, no, I don't think there will be one, one machine. One, I mean, th that's, that's the stuff of science fiction. Oh, you described it. Well, I mean, I, you could write a wonderful science fiction novel. Absolutely, that's been, that's been said. That's that's been said to me, and, th and that's said to uh, everybody who has an upbeat view on AI. That what you're talking about is science fiction. On the other, on the other hand, science fiction of you know Terminator running after us and things of that sort. That really need not be the case. It, it's it, it's 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 very difficult to predict more than five years into the future, anyway. I think at this point, we'd like to thank Arthur Miller for being the inaugural Harry Lustig lecturer. It gives an example of uh, how far ranging a lecturer can be, even in physics audience or to any general audience. So I think we learned a lot today about the machines in the future. Um, at this point, we'd like to really memorialize the event of the Harry Lustig lecture and ask people in the audience to come up front and we're going to take a picture. Memorializes the start of the Harry Lustig lecture. Again, I'd like to thank all of you. I think you can look up his book and maybe put your book on again. Yeah, sure. Later. A pleasure. We have some debate and discussion. So, again, I'd like to thank everyone for attending and please come up, those of you who want to come up, feel comfortable. Just take a picture. Quick lap. Keep on mute. What have you done? Available on Amazon. Okay. <laughs> I can take it. <laughs> Yes. <laughs>